This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Winning by Jack and Susie Welch, written in 2005. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or visit my website for downloads. Chapter 6 Hiring What Winners Are Made Of Sometimes when I appear before business audiences, I get a question that totally stumps me, as in I have no clue about the right answer. A couple of years ago, at a convention of insurance executives in San Diego, for instance, a woman stood up and said, what is the one thing you should ask in an interview to help you decide whom to hire? I shook my head and said, the one thing? I can't come up with one. What do you think? And she replied, that's why I'm asking you. The audience roared, certainly because I was so floored, but also because they could probably relate. Hiring good people is hard. Hiring great people is brutally hard. And yet nothing matters more in winning than getting the right people on the field. All the clever strategies and advanced technologies in the world are nowhere near as effective without great people to put them to work. Because hiring right is so important and so challenging, there's a lot of territory to cover in this chapter. First, we'll take a look at three acid tests you need to conduct before you even think about hiring someone. Next, we'll lay out the 4E and 1P frameworks for hiring that I have used in many years. It's named after the four characteristics it contains, which all begin with E, a nice coincidence, and there's 1P, passion, in there as well. After that, we'll explore the four special characteristics you look for when hiring leaders. The previous chapter was about what you do when you are a leader, the rules of leadership, as it were. This section is about how to hire leaders in the first place. Finally, I'll answer six FAQs about hiring that I get during my travels, plus that impossible one from the insurance executive in San Diego. After all, I've had a couple of years to think it over. The acid tests. Before you even think about assessing people for a job, they have to p pass through three screens. Remember, these tests should come at the outset of the hiring process, not right before you're about to sign on the dotted line. The first test is for integrity. Integrity is something of a fuzzy word, so let me tell you my definition. People with integrity tell the truth, and they keep their word. They take responsibility for past actions, admit mistakes, and fix them. They know the laws of their country, industry, and company, both in letter and spirit, and they abide by them. They play to win the right way, by the rules. How can you test for integrity? If a candidate comes from inside your company, that's pretty easy. You've seen him or her in action and know who they are. From the outside, you need to rely on reputation and reference checks. But those aren't foolproof. You also have to rely on your gut. Does the person seem real? Does she openly admit mistakes? Do they talk about their life with equal measures of candor and discretion? Over time, many of us develop an instinct for integrity. Just don't be afraid to use it. The second test is for intelligence. That doesn't mean a person must have read Shakespeare or can solve complex physics problems. It does mean that the candidate has a strong dose of intellectual curiosity with the breadth of knowledge to work with or lead other smart people in today's complex world. Sometimes people confuse education with intelligence. I certainly did that at some point at the start of my career. But with experience, I learned that smart people come from every kind of school. I've known many extremely bright people from places like Harvard and Yale. But some of the best executives I've worked with have attended places like Bryant University in Providence, Rhode Island, or the University of Dubuque in Iowa. GE was lucky to have all these people on its team. My point is that a candidate's education is only a piece of the picture, especially when it comes to intelligence. The third ticket to the game is maturity. You can, by the way, be mature at any age and immature too. Regardless, there are certain traits that seem to indicate a person has grown up. The individual can withstand the heat, handle stress and setbacks, and alternatively, when those wonderful moments arise, enjoy success with equal parts of joy and humility. Mature people respect the emotions of others. They feel confident, but are not arrogant. In fact, mature people usually have a sense of humor, especially about themselves. As with integrity, there is no real test for maturity. Again, you have to rely on reference checks, reputation, and more importantly, your gut. The 4E and 1P framework. The 4E framework took me years to solidify. No doubt, other people have other frameworks that work very well in building winning teams. 
but I found this one was consistently effective year after year across businesses and borders. The first E is positive energy. We just talked about this characteristic in the chapter on leadership. It means the ability to go, 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 to thrive on action and relish change. People with positive energy are generally extroverted and optimistic. They make conversation and friends easily. They start the day with enthusiasm and usually end it that way too, rarely seeming to tire in the middle. They don't complain about working hard. They love to work. But they also love to play. People with positive energy just love life. The second E is the ability to energize others. Positive energy is the ability to get other people revved up. People who energize can inspire their team to take on the impossible and enjoy the hell out of doing it. In fact, people would arm wrestle for the chance to work with them. Now, energizing people is not just about giving patent-esque speeches. It takes a deep knowledge of your business and strong persuasion skills to make a case that will galvanize others. A great example of an energizer is, Charlie, is Charlene Begley, who started with GE as a financial management trainee in 1988. After several years in various jobs, Charlene was selected to run GE's Six Sigma program in the transportation business, and that's where her leadership really began to shine. Galvanized by her intensity, her team really got its Six Sigma program on the corporate radar screen. It's hard to unpick Char Charlene's ability to energize because it's a brew of skills all mixed together. She is a great communicator who can clearly define objectives. She's serious about work, but she doesn't take herself too seriously. In fact, she has a good sense of humor and shares credit readily. Her attitude is always upbeat. No matter how hard the job, it can get done. Charlene's ability to energize that Six Sigma team was one of the key characteristics that got her out of the pile and set her on GE's fast track. After Six Sigma and a couple of other leadership roles, she was made head of GE's corporate audit staff and eventually became CEO of GE Fanuc Automation. Today, at 38, Charlene is CEO and president of GE's $3 billion rail business. The third E is edge, the courage to make tough yes or no decisions. Look, the world is filled with gray. Anyone can look at an issue from every different angle. Some smart people can and will analyze those angles indefinitely. But effective people know when to stop assessing and make a tough call, even without total information. Little is worse than a manager who at any level can't cut bait, the type that always says, bring it back in a month and we'll take a good hard look at it again or that awful type that says yes to you, but then someone else comes into the room and changes their mind. We call these wish-washy types, or last one out the door bosses. Some of the smartest people that I've hired over the years, many of them from consulting, had real difficulty with edge, especially when they were put into operations. In every situation, they always saw too many options, which inhibited them from taking action. That indecisiveness kept their organizations in limbo. In the end, for several of them, that was a fatal flaw. Which brings us to the fourth E, execute, the ability to get the job done. Maybe this fourth E seems obvious, but for a few years, there were just the first three E's. Thinking that these traits were more than sufficient, we evaluated hundreds of people and labeled a slew of them as high potentials and moved them into managerial roles. In that period, I traveled to personnel review sessions in the field with GE's head of HR, Bill Conaty. At the review sessions, we would refer to a single page that had each manager's photo on it, along with his or her boss's performance review, in three circles, one for each E that we, we were using at the time. Each one of these E's would be colored in to represent how well the individual was doing. For instance, a person with half a circle of energy, a full circle of energize, and a quarter circle of edge. Then, one Friday night, after a week-long trip to our Midwestern business, Bill and I were flying back to headquarters, looking over page after page of high potentials with three solidly colored in circles. Bill turned to me and said, You know, Jack, we're missing something. We have all these great people, but some of their results stink. What was missing was execution. It turns out you can have positive energy, the ability to energize everyone around you, the ability to make hard calls, and still knock it over the finish line. Being able to execute is a special and distinct skill. It means a person knows how to put decisions into action and push them forward to completion through resistance, chaos, or unexpected obstacles. 
people who can execute know that winning is about results. If a candidate has the four E's, then you look for that final P, which is passion. By passion, I mean a heartfelt, deep, and authentic excitement about work. People with passion care, really care in their bones, about colleagues, employees, and friends winning. They love to learn and grow, and they get a huge kick when the people around them do the same. The funny thing about people with passion, though, is that they usually aren't excited just about work. They tend to be passionate about everything. They're a sports trivia nut, or they're fanatical supporters of their alma mater, or they're political junkies. Whatever, they just have juice for life in their veins. Hiring for the top. The three preliminary acid tests in the 4E1P framework apply to any hiring decision, no matter what level in the organization. But sometimes you need to hire a senior level leader, someone who is going to run a major division or an entire company. In that case, there are four more highly developed characteristics that really matter. The first characteristic is authenticity. Why? It's simple. A person cannot ha- make hard decisions, hold unpopular positions, or stand tall for what he believes unless he knows who he is and feels comfortable with that. I'm talking about self confidence and conviction. These traits make a leader bold and decisive, which is absolutely critical in times when you must act quickly. Just as important, authenticity makes leaders likable, for lack of a better word. Their realness comes across in the way they communicate and reach people on an emotional level. Their words move them, their messages touch something inside. When I was at GE, I would occasionally encounter a very successful executive who just could not be promoted to the next level. In the early days, we would struggle with our reasoning. These executives demonstrated the right values and made the numbers, but usually their people did not connect with them. What was wrong? Finally, we figured out that these executives always had a certain phoniness to them. They pretended to be something they were not, more in control, more upbeat, and more savvy than they really were. They didn't sweat, they didn't cry, they squirmed in their own skin, playing a role of their own inventing. Leaders can't have an iota of fakeness. They have to know themselves so that they can be straight with the world, energize followers, and lead with the authority born of authenticity. The second characteristic is the ability to see around corners. Every leader has to have a vision and the ability to predict the future, but good leaders must have a special capacity to anticipate the radically unexpected. In business, the best leaders in brutally competitive environments have a sixth sense for market changes, as well as moves by existing competitors and new entrants. The former vice chairman of GE, Paolo Fresco, is a gifted chess player. He carried that skill into every global business deal he made over the course of 30 years. Somehow, because of his intuition and savvy, he could put himself in the chair of the person across the table, allowing him to predict every move in a negotiation. To our amazement, Paolo always saw what was coming next. No one ever came close to getting the better of him because he knew what his adversary was thinking before the adversary himself knew. The ability to see around corners is the ability to imagine the unimaginable. The third characteristic is a strong penchant to surround themselves with people better and smarter than they are. Every time we had a crisis at GE, I would quickly assemble a group of the smartest, gutsiest people I could find at any level from within the company and sometimes from without, and lean on them heavily for their knowledge and advice. I would make sure everyone in the room came at the problem from a different angle, and then I would have us all wallow in the information as we worked to solve the crisis. These sessions were almost always contentious, and the opinions that came at me were strong and varied. Yet, my best decisions arose from what I learned in these debates. Disagreement surfaced meaningful questions and forced us to challenge assumptions. Everyone came out of the experience more informed and better prepared to take on the next crisis. A good leader has the courage to put together a team of people who sometimes make him look like the dumbest person in the room. I know that sounds counterintuitive. You want your leader to be the smartest person in the room. But if he acts like he is, he won't get half the pushback he must get to make the best decisions. The fourth characteristic is heavy-duty resilience. Every leader makes mistakes. Every leader stumbles and falls. The question with a senior-level leader is, does she learn from her mistakes, regroup, and then get going again with renewed speed, conviction, and confidence? 
The name for this trait is resilience, and it is so important that a leader must have it going into a job, because if she doesn't, a crisis time is too late to learn it. That is why, when I place people in new leadership situations, I always look for candidates who had one or two very tough experiences. I particularly liked the people who had had the wind knocked out of them, but proved they could run even harder in the next race. The global business world today is going to lock any leader off her horse more than once. She must know how to get back in the saddle again. Hiring FAQs. Finally, let's look at the six FAQs, or frequently asked questions, I've received about hiring over the past several years. At the end of them, I will try to answer the insurance executives from San Diego about the one best question to ask in an interview. As I said earlier, I've been thinking about it for a long time now. Number one, how do you actually interview someone for a job? My immediate answer to this question is, don't ever rely entirely on one meeting. No matter how pressed for time you are or how promising someone looks, make sure every candidate is interviewed by several people. Over time, you will find that there are some people in your organization who have a special gift for picking out stars and phonies. Rely on them. Bill Conaty, my HR head, was a master of this. Whether it was with a handshake, a smile, or a way of talking about their family, job candidates were transparent to him. And listen when a trusted colleague tells you that his or her gut is negatively responding to a candidate. That uh-oh feeling is usually a sign that the candidate is not what they seem. At some point in the interview process, when it's your turn, make sure you exaggerate the challenge of the open job. Describe it on its worst day. Hard, contentious, political, full of uncertainty. After you crank it up, see if the candidate keeps saying yes, yes, yes. If he does, you should worry that he has a few other options, if any. You may even be his sole hope of employment. Be impressed if the candidate starts peppering you back with hard questions like, how soon do you expect the results to be achieved? Or, do I have enough people to make this happen? Be even more impressed if she asks you about the company's values. The difficulty of a job will bring good candidates to the edge of their seats with curiosity and firm self-confidence, not over-enthusiastic acquiescence. Finally, after all the talking is done, don't check just the references the candidate gives you. Call around, but you know that. When you do, don't allow the conversation to be perfunctory. Stop yourself from doing something natural, just hearing the good news that you want to hear. Force yourself to challenge anything that sounds like lawyer speak. Use your chits. Promise you won't repeat what you hear. Doing that, you'll get what I did more times than I can count. Number two, I just need to hire someone for technical expertise. Why do I need to bother with the four E's? Obviously, hiring a person who is both a technical star and demonstrates the four E's would be very nice. But if you're really just desperate for a person with a certain specialty, say a computer programmer or a research scientist, then I would be satisfied with energy and passion, along with a bucket full of raw intelligence, great prior experience, and of course, integrity. You need that with any person you hire. Number three, what if someone is missing one or two of the E's? Can training fill in the gaps? Any candidate you hire in a managerial role must have the first two E's, positive energy and the ability to energize others. Those are personality traits, and I don't think that they can be trained into someone. Frankly, I would encourage you not to hire any team member, manager or not, without a good dose of positive energy. People without it just enervate an organization. Edge and execution, on the other hand, can be developed with experience and management training. Time after time, I've seen people learn how to make tough calls and deliver results. The GE audit staff offers numerous examples. Every year, it brings on board about 120 people, primarily from GE's financial management training program, but about a quarter from other functions, such as engineering and manufacturing. The typical new hire in auditing has about three years of experience with the company. Their first year, these new kids travel to GE businesses around the world as members of three to six person audit teams. After 12 weeks of grueling analysis, they return to the headquarters of the business they've just audited to present their findings to the CFO and CEO. Often, they've got plenty to tell, some of it not so pretty. Early on, these young auditors are tentative, holding their comments while the more senior members of the team run the show. 
But over time, usually three to five years, I've seen these auditors develop an edge that is razor sharp. It comes from observing their more experienced teammates, lots of coaching, and plenty of practice. They also develop an incredible knack for execution. After all, they are responsible for making sure their recommendations have been implemented. If they haven't, all hell breaks loose, and that's a good teacher. The proof that edge and execution can be learned is clear. Several CEOs of GE's biz biggest businesses and vice chairmen are veterans of the audit staff development process. Question number four. Can a person get ahead in business without the four E's or passion? And the answer is absolutely yes. A person can reach great heights just by being very smart or just by the sheer ability to get things done. We can all think of examples of these individuals. Many are the inventors and entrepreneurs of the world, and usually they run their own shows. But within an organization, I just haven't seen too many who have sustained success, especially as leaders, without the four E's and passion. Question five. I've always tried to hire people who can hit the ground running. What do you think about that as a decisive factor? When hiring, you have to make a trade-off. If you hire someone, do you hire someone to get a job done fast or do you hire him based on his potential for growth? My advice is try to pick the second option. I don't always feel that way though. The first time I hired managers was when I was 28 years old and I needed to build a functional team. I hired a PhD who was a peer of mine to be a manager of R&D. For marketing, I hired a good fellow who was smart and was there. And for a manufacturing manager, my selection was an experienced hand. I'd seen him in action in another part of the same division. Although I didn't think of it at the time, most of these people had no future beyond the jobs I had just put them in. Our business was growing rapidly and they didn't have the skills to grow with it. In fact, by the time the business was four years old, all of them were gone and we were filling the positions again. With my first shot at hiring managers, I didn't know any better. I just wanted to get the job done, but eventually I learned that it pays to go for the high potentials who can grow with the business or are capable of moving up somewhere in elsewhere in the organizations. Hiring or hi a highly skilled blocker, someone who will hit the ground running but has no future beyond the open in position is tempting because it solves an immediate need. But blockers soon become enervating. They get bored by the familiarity of the work or, as in my early case, swamped by its challenges. They're people to get discouraged because they see their bosses going nowhere, which makes them wonder about their own opportunities. A good rule of thumb, then, is not to hire someone into the last job of his or her career unless it's to be head of a function or CEO. Question six, how long does it take to know if you've hired right? And the answer is usually within a year, certainly within two, it is pretty clear if, you've, if someone is getting the results you'd hoped for. It's relatively easy to notice when a person lacks the energy and execution you've anticipated. But the ability to energize and the capacity for edge sometimes take longer to show up in a new environment. People want to fit in before they start rousing the team to a cause or making the tough calls. As I said, within two years at the most, if an employee is still falling short of your expectations, it is time to admit your mistake and start the process of moving the person out. If you have been doing your job and giving honest evaluations along the way, the employee shouldn't be surprised, and an equitable severance package will likewise soften the blow. Hiring right is hard. I'd say as a young manager, I picked the right people about 50% of the time. 30 years later, I had improved to about 80%. My point is, don't beat yourself up if you get hiring wrong some of the time, especially when you're starting out. Situations change, people change, and you change. Just re remember, every hiring mistake is yours. You have to fix it, not the HR person you call in to do your dirty work. Take responsibility and make sure the ending is candid and fair. And now for our San Diego question. What is the one thing you should ask in an interview to help you decide whom to hire? If I had just one area to probe at an interview, it would be about why the candidate left his or her previous job and the one before that. Was it the environment? Was it the boss? Was it the team? What exactly made you leave? There is so much information in those answers. Keep digging and dig deep. Maybe the candidate just expects too much from a job or a company. He wants a boss who is entirely hands-off or teammates who always agree. Maybe he wants too much reward too fast. 
Or maybe she's leaving her last job because it has just what you want. Too much energy to be held back. Too, so much ability to energize, she wants to manage more people. Too much edge for a nami pammy employer. And such a strong ability to execute that she needs more challenge. The key is, listen closely. Get in the candidate's skin. Why a person has left a job or jobs tells you more about them than almost any other piece of data. Your goal in hiring is to get the right players on the field. Luckily, great people are everywhere. You just, you just have to know how to pick them. It's so easy to just hire people that you like. After all, you'll be spending the, ma the majority of your waking hours with them. It's also easy to hire people with relevant experience. They'll get the job done. But friendship and experience are never enough. Every person you hire has to have integrity, intelligence, and maturity. Once you've got those, look hard for people with the four E's and passion. Beyond that, at the senior level, look for authenticity, foresight, the willingness to draw on others for advice, and resilience. Put it all together, and those are the people who win. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.